Prayer changes things uh, because God changes things. Amen. Um, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 6 once again. Uh, we've made it to the last chapter of Ephesians. It's a six-chapter book. Uh, we got a couple more weeks in Ephesians, and one of the reasons I chose this book to preach through verse by verse over the course of 13 weeks is I get to deal with topics like marriage last week, and today we're going to talk about parents and parenting, and uh, not just for when our children are under the age of 18 living at home, but uh, all of our kids, my wife and I have grown up, and, and we've entered the blessed state of grandparenting, which is wonderful because we can spoil them, and when the kids need training, we can say it's not our job. <laughs> it's great. Anyway, um, but we're going to talk about our relationships with our parents, uh, even as they get older, uh, and our racial relationship with our adult children. And you know, because God's Word truly speaks into every part of our lives. Uh, so if you're here today, even if you don't have kids, you do have a parent uh, or two because you're here. You wouldn't be here if you didn't. Um, you know, one of the things I just want to start by saying is I think a lot of us, this is just based on what I hear from people, is that we kind of look at our lives in sections or, or pieces. And we have more than six, but I couldn't fit more than six. But follow me what I'm saying this. A lot of us, we think, okay, I've got this part of my life that's about relationships, and I have people that I care about, and I want to work on my relationships with my friends or my family or coworkers or whatever. And then we have kind of that work part of our lives, our career or our job. And even if you don't have a job, there's stuff that you have to do, like mowing and laundry and shopping, and so we have those tasks, and we have that area of our life. And then we have kind of our health, right? We need to take care of ourselves and drink water and exercise, or maybe not so much, or, uh, you know, uh, vitamins and, and personal hygiene and, and things like that. So we, we have kind of the health part. And then we have our financial part of our lives, you know, where we're earning money, we're budgeting, and we're spending, and we're saving, and we're giving, and how we handle our money. And then we have, you know, the, the recreational part of our life where, uh, you know, you got to have good mental health, you got to have good emotional health, you've got to uh, have a hobby or a uh, vacation or, or um, you know, some entertainment or something like that. And last, of course, but not least, we have the spiritual part of our lives where we, we work on our relationship with God. Uh, there we go. Uh, where, where our faith, you know, coming to church, reading the Bible, praying, things like that. And and, and I see this because I hear a lot of people talk like this. It's like, you know, I've, I've really just um, been spending so much time at work and doing these things. I need to work on my, my health. I haven't been taking care of my health. So we kind of shift into a mode where we're focused on our health for a while. And then it's like, man, I've been doing so much. I haven't been taking care of. I, I need to relax and get away and have some fun. And so, you know, and then it's like, well, I haven't been to church for a while. I haven't read my Bible for a while. So then we start working on the spiritual part of our lives. And and, and I, I recognize that this is, again, I believe that how most people look at their lives in these sections. But here's the thing. If you and I are followers of Christ, this isn't right because God is not a piece of the pie. Okay? God is the whole pie. Okay? That's, that's what the word surrender means. It means that every, listen, there's not a single area of your life that God's word has not spoken into. His word speaks into how we should have relationships with people and forgive them and love them and serve them. His word speaks into how we work and what we should do at work and do our work heartily as unto the Lord. And his word speaks into how we handle our finances and even the types of things we put into our body, which are temples of the Holy Spirit. And uh, uh, some of us need to recognize that. Anyway, um, I'm talking about, you know, I, I just, I worship at the temple of Krispy Kreme. Anyway, um, <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, how we handle our money and, of course, how to, how to work on it. And listen, where I'm going with this is that God's Word speaks into how we raise our children and, and parent and uh, what, we're, what we're to do. And, and this is the thing that I've seen over the years. You know, I know I was talking to, to the life group. I love hanging out with the young people. Uh, in, in I, the last couple of life groups, I've had the privilege of hanging out with young people. And it's really cool because their prayer requests aren't all about medical things. But anyway... Um, <laughs> I'll pray for my back and my knee. No, I'm sorry. I'm making fun. I'm, hey, I'm, I'm with you guys, okay? My, anyway, uh, but, but the young people, you know, we were talking this morning about how our children are stewardship. Uh, you know, when we talk about stewardship in church, everyone thinks, oh, that's money. Well, the idea of a steward is somebody who's taking care of something that doesn't belong to them. And so, yes, the biblical principle when it comes to money is it's not my money. Everything I have is God's, and, and I need to be a good steward. But the reality is, is our children are not ours. 
Okay? They belong to him. He created them. We get a stewardship of them for maybe 18 years, you know, maybe 20 if they move back in, 25, 30. Anyway, um, you know, just kidding, just kidding. You know, uh, the, the idea is there's only so much time we have, and then like arrows in the hand of the warrior, we send them out. And so we have a stewardship to, to train and to teach our children. And, and I know every parent that I've met wants to be a good parent, and we do research, and we look and even back, not just this generation, but back in my generation, I see that parents don't trust the Bible as much as we do the experts of the day, okay? Today, it's, you know, Google. Back in my day, it was Dr. Spock. And I'm not talking about, you know, live long and prosper, Spock. I'm, I'm talking about there was a, a, an author who sold about 50 million books on how to raise kids, and it was, it was just the leading experts of the day. And don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with getting good advice from a lot of parenting books and resources that are out there. But the problem that we have to watch is what is the worldview of the person who is teaching? Because the biblical worldview is that your children are created in the image of God, but there's foolishness bound up in the heart of that child. There's a sin nature, and the greatest need that your child has is to know the gospel. And God knows more than Dr. Spock. He really does, uh, about how to raise your children. And so one of the things I want to challenge you this morning is if you're, you know, if you have children at home to just give me 30 minutes this morning to look at what the Word, word of God says, there's no way we can cover everything. This is going to be like an eight-part series wrapped up into 30 minutes. So again, it's kind of the, the, the large view. Um, but we're just going to read four verses from Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. And here's what the Word of God says. It says, children... Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is your first commandment, with a promise, that it, may will, uh, that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. This is the right Spock, live long and prosper, okay, when you honor your father and mother. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. I always think it's interesting that it says that to fathers, because uh, maybe we're the ones that are more provoking, or Colossians says exasperating. So let me just do this again, because it's really short. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. And you're a Christian home. Why? Because it's right. Again, honor your father and mother. And notice he says it's the first commandment. If you go back to Moses and the Ten Suggestions, Ten Commandments that were on Mount Sinai, handed down tablets of stone. This was so important that God put it on the tablet of stone. By the way, it's the fifth commandment. The other four all have to do with God. So it was on the same tablet of stone that is to love God, and the other tablet was about loving others. You say, well, parents, isn't that about loving others? Who chose your parents? We didn't get to choose our parents. Some of you would like, I'd like a return policy like Amazon has, you know. Uh, but we don't, we don't. God is sovereign. He chose your parents. We didn't get to pick them out. And, uh, and so to honor your parents was something so important. It was taught even on the Ten Commandments. And then again, fathers, don't exasperate or provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now, what I'm going to do this morning inside your bulletin, you'll see this little chart. And uh, what I want to do is just talk about, this is a big picture overview, the stages of life. Preteen is if you have kids birth to about 11, okay, there's, there's, there's that section of life, and then maybe from the age of 12 to uh, when they move out of the house, 18, 19, whatever it is, and they're on their own, and then adults, okay, so if we're splitting up life in those three sections. On the left side of this chart, we're going to look at what the God says is the children's responsibility towards the parents, even as adults, I have a responsibility towards my parents, and then on the right side, we'll look at what is the parent's responsibility towards the children. Again, this is just a big picture overview. So if you're starting, let's go on the top left, and I want you to write down the word obey, because the Bible's very clear. We just read it, Ephesians 6, 1, children, obey your parents in the Lord. There's only one command in the New Testament for children, and this is it. And why do your kids need to obey you when they're young? Not because you're bigger, not because you can ground them or spank them or something like that. They have to obey you because God says so. 
And this is important for us to understand that God has established an authority structure because, again, this is that stewardship part. Your children don't belong to you. They belong to God. But God has placed you and I for a temporary period of time to act on his behalf to teach our children obedience because all of us are under authority. Notice this authority structure isn't, child, you obey, obey me and I do whatever I want, right? It's Biblical parenting calls us as parents to live in submission, in obedience to God and our children. When your children disobey you, one of the mistakes we make is we get hurt. We take it personally. How could you do that? I'm your mother. I've done so much for you. Listen, when they sin against you, don't take it personally. It's not about you. They're sinning against God. That's what it is. They're sinning against God. And so when you reach out and make your children obey, it's a rescue mission to bring them back in obedience to God. Because if your children, my mentor Larry Frickle used to say this. We called it a frickleism. He, he would say, if your children won't obey an authority they can see, they will never obey an authority they cannot see. Okay? So God has established you as the authority. Now, you're sitting here thinking, Pastor, this is great. You're teaching children to obey, but my kids are over in kids' church. Shouldn't you be over there telling them that they should obey? Well, yes, but I would also say this, that there's obviously a, a command to us as parents that's implied in this, which is that we have a responsibility to do what we can to call our children to obedience. Not because we want to control them, not because we're angry at them and we want to manipulate them, but because this is what God's word says. How do we make our children obey? Here's the second word, and it's train. The Bible uses the word train when it comes to teaching your children to obey. Teaching is verbal instruction. Training is both discipline and instruction, which is actions and words. The Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he's old, he will not depart from it. And that word train uh, you know, you know about training. And I, I love it, that verse, because it says, in the way he should go. It literally says, in the way he is bent. Okay? Your children, we have five children, and one thing I discovered is our training method had to do a little bit of tweaking depending on the child. Because kids are different. You understand? You can't just do the same cookie cutter thing for, for all of them. They, they have different directions. But the training process is, and you know what training is. Training is... Uh, it's, uh, again, as we mentioned, it's both actions and words, okay? Discipline and instruction. We raise them in the discipline and instruction. And notice that actions is first. It doesn't say instruct and discipline. It says discipline and instruct. Because when children are young, even before they can talk, you can begin training them through actions to obey. And then as they get older, you use more words. Now, again, you know what training is. These are all pictures and examples of different types of training. And one of the things I want to recognize is that training is not fun. It is not fun. It is not fun to be disciplined. If you tell me that you like discipline, you're lying. Okay? We like the results that discipline brings in our life. But when you are training, military training, CrossFit training, music training, practicing over and over again, there's consistency, there's repetition, there's endurance. I mean, it is a lot of hard work. But here's what the Bible says. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, okay? It's not joyful in the moment. But to those who have been trained by it afterwards, it brings a peaceful fruit of righteousness. There's a fruit that comes out of the training. That's why we discipline ourselves in certain areas of our life. We may not enjoy the discipline, but we like the result that it happens. And it's hard. I want to encourage you young parents. Man, my wife and I, when we were in the midst of it, we had five children under the age of 11. And I want you to know, if you look deep into our eyes, this is what you see. Okay? <laughs> we didn't sleep for like five years uh, at that time because it is hard work to train your children. But here's the thing. My wife and I came to a point in our parenting where we realized we had no idea what we were doing, and, and we began to look into God's Word and said, okay, we're going to try to take this seriously. And so we were so mean, we trained our children to obey us the first time we spoke to them without challenging our authority, without making an excuse, and without delaying, because delayed obedience is disobedience. Yeah, I'll, I'll obey you when I get to it, Mom and Dad. Now... 
we, did, we didn't want to provoke them to wrath, and so we gave them, um, you know, like if they're in the middle of playing a video game, you can't just say, stop what you're doing and go clean your room, because that's just not kind. But we would say, okay, how much time you got left on your game? We've got about five minutes. Okay, I'm giving you a five-minute warning. At the end of five minutes, you're going to go clean your room, you know. Um, and sometimes we had to give them the opportunity to appeal, like we'd say, okay, I want you to go, I'll use clean your room again, go clean your room. It's like, mom, can I appeal? What is it? Well, dad told me to go do this first. Okay, well, go ahead and do that, and then go clean your room. But it's a lot of work, but we, we were able to, by the grace of God, train our children when they were young. And, and the, the reward and the benefit of that is when we would go out in public, we weren't afraid of our kids running off. They would hold our hands. If they ran towards the street, we'd say, stop. We could obey them. We could actually save their lives. I mean, this is an important thing. And I want to say that I see parents today. I'm not talking about anybody here, okay? I'm not talking about my own children. These are hypothetical parents, okay? Uh, but I see parents all the time, and they're training their children to ignore them. Because they'll say, stop running. And then the child will not stop running, and the parent does nothing. And you say, stop running again, and the child does nothing, and, you know, and then you start raising your voice. See, you can train your children to wait until you yell, because what they're learning is, okay, nothing's going to happen until you yell. Or you can train your children to wait till you get to three, one, two, and then they'll obey you, right? But that's what you're doing. That's not them. You can train your children to obey you the first time. Now, one of the things I want to encourage you, parents, just I'm spending a little more time on the training part here. Don't give commands that you don't expect your children to obey, okay? If you're going to tell them to do something, make sure they do it, and, and maybe you don't want to tell them to do it, because rules without consequences are only suggestions. And again, I see this, hypothetical parent, you know, a uh, child takes something or does something that they know is wrong, and the parent says, you shouldn't have done that, that was wrong, and then there's no consequence. The consequence was, I got talked to. I guess I'll do it again, and next time, I'll get talked to. Do you understand? So training is hard work. How do we train? Well, God, the Bible says that God has provided a way, uh, especially if you start young, that helps get to your children's soul. This is a heart issue. Proverbs 23 says, do not hold back discipline from the child, although you strike him with a rod. Now, let me stop right there. This is not a big, huge stick or a metal bar that you're beating. This is not abuse. We're talking about a little switch. We're talking about a small wooden spoon. We're talking about the general actions that happen when our children are young. And I recognize that this has been abused and it's been done in anger. And there are so many ways we can do it wrong. But when you do it biblically and right, it reaches the heart of the young child. Again, we're talking about young children here. Okay? It says, you shall strike him with the rod and rescue his soul from death. A couple more here. Proverbs 22, 15, foolishness is bound up in the heart of the child. We don't discipline children for being childish. It's the rebellious spirit. It's the sin nature that says, no, I'm not going to do what you want to do. And again, it says the rod that this type of discipline will action will remove it from him. Uh, one more verse I'll give you. He who withholds the rod hates his son. A lot of times we say, I love my kids too much to try to do something like this. But I think it's more, the Bible says, if you love them, you will discipline them. And it's, it's hard. It's, you know, we want to be their friend. God hasn't called you to be their friend. He's called you to be the parent. And the Bible says we have to make our children obey. Again, give clear warnings, do it in private, never do it in anger. But here's the beauty. If you do it right, you say, look, I'm, you, you've disobeyed me. Yep, okay, I'm going to give you two spankings. It's done. You hug them. They're go and they're forgiven. And it's gone, and they go on, and it's not like you're grounded for three days or, you know, whatever. And it works, and it's consistent. When you're consistent with it, uh, God reaches into the hearts of your children. So, again, it's hard work. But, I mean, even when our kids, I'll tell you, you know what? We used to not childproof our home. I see people today, they got all these locks, and they don't put anything out. We, we, when, when we had, you know, when your child is one and a half, and they reach for that thing on the table... You can say no. And what do they do? They look right at you and go, <laughs> right? And then you come over and you tap their hand. I'm not being abusive. I'm saying you go like that. And they go, oh. And if you're consistent, the next time you say no, they'll go, 
like that. Oh my goodness. It's training, it's hard work again. Not abusive. There's, there's plenty of books and things that you can read that, that teaches this. Now, let's move on because I want to move beyond the, the young years and say, let's, in fact, we got a lot of teenagers in here. Where are my teenagers? Oh, all the way in the back. Yeah, that's where, thank you, teenagers. And by the way, I'm going to say, let me just say something to you young people. I truly believe that when you reach the age of 12, spiritually, biblically, you've become a responsible, hate to use this word, adult. In God's eyes, spiritually, the Bible says, Isaiah 7, Deuteronomy, I think it's 29, that children grow up when they come to an age where they are able to discern right from wrong and choose good and refuse evil. And I think that somewhere around the age of 12, Jesus raised a girl from the dead at the age of 12. At the age of 12, the bar mitzvah happened. That meant a Jewish young boy, when he was 12 years old, was accountable to be a son of the law. And most importantly, there was a man, you might have heard of his name, Jesus, who was the son of God, who was born of a virgin, grew up just like you and I did without sin. And we know nothing about his life from birth to 30 Except one incident at guess what age? 12. And at the age of 12, his mother said to him, Jesus, your father and I, Joseph, have been worried about you. And he said, Mom, I was in my father's house. So at the age of 12, Jesus knew he was the son of God. What did he do? The Bible says he submitted to his parents' authority. And that's the word I want to challenge you, that as a teenager, now you're more mature, but you're still living in your parents' home. You're subject to them. You may not agree with their values. You may not uh, agree with their rules, but you need to be respectful. Listen, Jesus, here's what the Bible says, that Jesus went down with his mother and stepfather to Nazareth, and he continued in subjection to them. Now, imagine he could have said, you know, Mom, I'm the son of God, and by the way, I created you, so I don't think I need to obey your rules anymore. That's not what he did. He continued, he put himself under the authority of his parents. And uh, so you can be a respectful teenager. I know that that's not uh, a popular thing these days, but the Bible calls us to. And that means even if your parents are being, I mean, come on, you know, I've heard some advice from children, that it, when your dad yells at you and says, do I look stupid to you? Don't answer him. <laughs> right? You know, even if your parents are, are not perfect, which, oh, by the way, newsflash, they're not. And when you get to be 12, 13, 16, you realize, wow, my parents have some issues. But God has still called them to be in charge. Listen, what, <laughs> what are you laughing at, brother? <laughs> Settle down, Okay. It's true. We have, to, we have to live in submission. And, and I told my kids all the time, I said, look, someday you're going to move out. You know, one, one of our a lot of our children didn't want to go to church. Imagine that. <laughs> kids don't want to go to church. Yeah. Uh, we just said, look, when you move out, you can make the choices on your own, but you're in our house, and here's some of the things we're going to do. Now, let's move on and talk about parenting teenagers. The, the training Hopefully you've done that more so when they're younger uh, with discipline and instruction and teaching. The real focus on this stage, I believe, biblically is to model and to teach. To model. Parenting is more caught than it is taught. Okay? They have to see the Bible lived out. They have to see that how the gospel works in the home. Okay? Because, again, our kids are old enough to see our sin. They also have to see our faith uh, because they're watching. And uh, my wife and I, when we, you know, we would sin, we'd have to go to them and humble ourselves and ask for forgiveness. And, and they see the gospel being lived out. So, again, we have a responsibility to, uh, to imitate Christ as the best we can to model for our children what it looks like. But also teaching. I want to tell you that teaching your kids isn't just about Teach them how to, do you know the Bible tells you that it is not the children's directors and youth pastors' responsibility to teach your kids about the Lord? Guess whose responsibility it is? Over and over again, I, I could preach a whole sermon on this, okay, um, that, that you, 
uh, uh, are responsible, you know, to teach your children through daily life, through your words and actions, to tell them about the Lord. And they come to church and they're getting that same message from other people. Uh, but this is, this is what God has called us to do. Now, let me give one caution to parents right now about authority and obedience in this stage of life. I put this um, graph inside your bulletin. It was helpful to Tammy and I because you might have guessed I'm, I kind of was more on the obedient side of things with my, with my kids as they grew up. But this was super helpful to me, that when your children are born, it's all about authority. But by the time they're hypothetically 18 and move out of the house, you don't have any authority over them. I suppose if you're paying their college uh, tuition, you might have some authority. But once your kids move out, you can't really tell them what to do. The authority is gone, but what you want, ideally, is to slowly let go of that authority. You don't want it to be authority, 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 18, and then, right? You want to slowly reduce some of that authority and hopefully get to a point, my goal is that my children who are 20, 22, 25, they call up me or they call up mom and they ask for our advice. Dad, what do you think I should do? Yes. You know, it's great. I get, to be, I get to give some input into their lives. By the way, one of the rules that I've had to make with my adult children is, I want to be able to speak into your life, but I'm giving you the total freedom not to do what I suggest you do. And guess what? They do that usually. <laughs> they don't do what I suggest, and I just have to love them and say, that's okay. You know, I'm glad I got to share with you this great advice that you're not going to follow. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Kids got to make their own decisions. Now, here's what I'm saying. When your kids, these are the teenage years here. So mom and dad, I know you're biblical. God's called you to submit, be under authority, but you got to start loosening up. You got to start letting them make some, not all, some of their own decisions in the safety of your home, even if it's a bad decision because it, they, you want them to fail and fall into the safety of the loving family that can help them grow from this. You don't want them to move out and make some of those mistakes. I mean, did anybody here not have to learn everything the hard way? I mean, we do. We like, we, okay, thank you, Carson. Very good. Um, you know, uh, you still got a few more years, but that's okay. Uh, this is what happens. You know, the kids are going to make some mistakes, and you got to, now, you are the parent, so you still have to choose where you're going to draw the line. Now, again, for my wife and I, this is where you talk. If you're a single parent, you get some wisdom, but you decide what are the hills you're going to die on, okay? My wife and I loosened up on a lot of things, but it, it amazes to me. Now, again, I am not trying to say this. We said going to church is a hill to die on. If you live in the Shiner household, you will go to church. And, and one of our kids uh, even said, look, I don't know that I believe in God. You can't make me believe in God. You said, you're right. I can't make you believe. But you live in our house. You're 17. You're going to come to church for three hours. Be respectful. You don't have to believe it. And go home. Unless you would like to cook your own food and find your own rent and pay for your own car and all those other things. We're such mean parents. Oh, my gosh. Well, you make your kids not go out all night. You make your kids not do drugs. You make your kids go to school because there are some hills to die on, right? And as parents, we decided that spiritually forcing our children to go to church, we're so mean. I know. But again, we had to loosen up the authority. So I just, I just want to encourage you with that. Let them make some of their own decisions, but again, decide uh, at the end of the day where you're going to draw that line. Lastly, let's talk about adults. Kids grow up and they become adults. And by the grace of God, all of our children are now adults. Our youngest is about 23. Our oldest is 34. Uh, for some reason, they won't obey us anymore. Um, they don't really submit to us anymore. Uh, but you know what? By the grace of God, they still honor us. See, honor is something that happens at every stage. Children are to honor their parents. Teenagers are to honor their parents. And as adults, we honor our parents. And you know what? It's really hard because I know some of us have parents that from the human perspective, we might think they're not worthy of much honor. Family's difficult. You know, you have those love-hate relationships with one of your parents or maybe both of them. Or maybe you're in a situation where you've been really wounded and hurt by your mom or your dad and they're dead. And you're still dealing with this. And I want to encourage you 
to find the grace of forgiveness in releasing them to God and knowing that they did the best that they could in that time because it's going to bring healing to your life. We need to honor our parents at every stage of their life. Um, and that might mean uh, knowing your parents. It's like, I mean, I'm just being honest with you guys. I love my parents. My dad, you've heard me talk a lot about him. He's a pretty unique character. And I don't get him, but I totally get him, if you know what I mean. I know exactly what not to talk about with my dad because it's not going to go well. Do you understand? And that's honor, to me, that's honoring him. But I'm also going over this afternoon and I'm going to pressure wash his, you know, he's 87 years old. He can't do certain things. By the way, the Bible tells us that honoring your parents is to take care of them when they get older. 1 Timothy 5, Mark chapter 7. Beth Clark, how long did you take care of Rosie? 15 years. You honored God and you honored your mother. She was working kind of a full-time job. For, her mom lived a long time. How old was your mother when she passed? 98. Yeah. And, and Beth was, you should talk to Beth sometime about that. And I know there's some other people here. I just met somebody who's taking care of their mom. That's what it means to honor them. And you honor them because to honor them is to honor. Now you're getting it. It's not about the person. When they, kids disobey you, they're disobeying God. When you honor your parents, you're honoring God. It all comes back to that relationship with the Lord. Lastly, what are we uh, to do? And again, there's a whole lot more. I just don't have time, but uh, let's just kind of wrap this up. What do, what do we do with our kids um, when they're older? Uh, what's our responsibility towards them? And by the way, again, I know a lot of you and your personal story, you have adult children who you're not in relationship with and they're not speaking to you. And I know that there's not much you can do. That's the hardship of, of being a parent is you do your best and kids are going to make their own choices just like our parents make their own choices. But if God gives you the opportunity to be in relationship with your adult children, the best word that I could come up with is uh, to be a, an encourager, an encourager. There's a lot of other words I could use, consultant, you know, consultant when they ask for the advice, um, friend, you know, at, the, at some point, and it's hard for me because I've always been a pastor, I've always been a teacher, I've always been, you know, my kids had it rough, I was both their dad and their pastor, um, but I recognized on this last trip going out to visit my son, Mark, who lives in Nashville, that he really just wants me to be his friend right now, you know? And he is. He is my brother in Christ. He is a man. We're equal. He doesn't need dad to give him advice all the time. And so I have to learn to adjust. I have to learn to let go. I have to learn to come alongside and say, man, you're doing great. And here's what I see God doing in your life. And here's some areas I'm really proud of you. And because God knows it's hard to be a young person in today's age. Amen? And you know, there's this pride part of me that's like, well, my daughter doesn't text me or my son doesn't call me or whatever. And then the Holy Spirit's like, yeah, Jim, when was the last time you called them? Ooh. Hey, could you settle down over there? <laughs> what do you think this is, an interactive sermon? I love it, Michael. Bring it. Keep bringing it. I'm just messing with you. That's good. It's true. I need to call my sons. I need to text my daughters. I need to reach out to my kids as much as I can to encourage them. I still love them. Yeah, my job of parenting, you know, in one aspect it's done, but they still need a friend and someone they can trust that they can go. And so, again, your kids might not respond to your text, but send them a text and say, I love you, thinking of you today. And God knows the greatest thing we can do. Uh, last slide. Here we go. We need help, don't we? Parenting's hard. I do not have all the answers. Please don't. I don't. My wife and I messed up a hundred times, and if you want to know, you can ask our kids how much we messed up. But by the grace of God, we prayed and we continue to ask for help, and we need God's help. Ask the Lord for wisdom. If anyone lacks wisdom, he'll, you know, if anyone lacks wisdom, ask of God, and it will be given to him. So we, we need wisdom in, in raising our children. And seek counsel of other people around you in your life. 
Google might give you some help, but I might suggest you look into God's Word and talk to some godly parents who have raised kids already and their kids seem to be doing okay or somebody. One of the greatest things I had is I had a friend. I had two daughters followed by three sons, and he had three sons followed by three daughters. And so he had already been through the son part, and I had already been through the daughter part, so we became like best friends. Okay, because he could give me advice and I could give him advice. And we talked about how to navigate through. Because at the end of the day, what's more important than our children? Not much. So what we're going to do this morning is um, I'm going to have to have the worship team come back up here again. I mentioned that we're going to have an altar call. We're going to have our prayer team come up. I'm going to ask Pastor Aaron to come stand here and others be here. There'll be somebody in the back. And I want to encourage you. As we sing the song, the song has come to the altar, uh, that maybe just as a mom and a dad or or individually as a single parent, you come, you can ask one of these to pray with you. Ask one of these to pray with you or just come up and take some time. Maybe you want to pray for a wayward daughter or son, a broken relationship. You know, you can't reach them. They're not listening to you, but God can. Would you stand with me? Would you stand with me? And uh, let's just offer this up to the Lord. And as we sing this song, I encourage you to to come and pray for your children, pray for your parents, whatever.